Well, I am very happy to welcome my friend Allie to the Untangled Faith podcast. We met several years ago, right after I first started the podcast. Mm-hmm. Allie reached out to me and told me some of her story. And because it is Mental Health Awareness Month, um, I think we're going to get this episode in towards the end, probably the very last week of the month, maybe also the beginning of June. But it's always a good time to talk about this because our churches have some blind spots when it comes to mental health. And so Allie has said that she would love to share some of her story. And so I'm just going to let Allie take it away. Thanks for having me. I so appreciate um, the chance to talk about this, although it feels really vulnerable. Yeah. So, um, but I think it's worth it if it helps one person. And we also got to meet in person. That's right. We did a year ago, like a year ago this weekend. So good. I loved that. Um, all right. So my story, it would, it would start around, um, it was around April, 2017. Um, and I was walking with a friend and I was really honest about some of the things that I was feeling, uh, and thinking, and I confided in her that I, um, was suicidal and I didn't want to die. Um, but I couldn't picture myself continuing to live Mm. and it's, it was like a numbness. It didn't feel like sadness to me. It felt like a, like a numbness or a lack of feeling, uh, kind of empty. Sometimes I, I'll explain it. Like it's like a black tunnel Mm -hmm. and you can't find your way out and you can't turn back. It's it's just a whole, like a black, a black zone. Um, so I was talking to her about that and she was like, Ellie, um, like these are not normal. It's not normal to have these. You, you know, you need help. And I had lived with these thoughts for so long that I thought yeah. everyone battled these and yeah. I was just doing my best to battle them and push them away. So this was a new thing for you to think, oh, this is more than something that I should be hang- holding on to every day. This is a this is a little bit bigger deal. Right. Yeah. I didn't realize it was a big, it was a big deal. I mean, it felt bad. Like it didn't yeah. feel okay, but as a, maybe other people feel this way too. And somehow they're making it so yeah, I can yeah. make it through. So these, I, I um, was honest with her. I was honest with her and um, these thoughts just had gotten really loud. They were louder than they ever had been, uh, in my life. And it was starting to show in, I couldn't eat and I couldn't sleep and my hair was falling out. And I had kind of become like a shell Mm. of myself and I needed a lot of support and help from my family just for daily, just for daily things. Um, I did have a therapist at the time. Um, and I was working through some kind of like repressed childhood trauma. We were doing EMDR uh, and I had gotten stuck on a memory that we, I just couldn't dig myself mm-hmm. out of. And now looking back, I can, I can see that that was not helpful and I didn't quite have the coping skills to deal with what I was um, working through. And it probably wasn't the therapist that was right mm-hmm. Yeah, it wasn't a good know. fit. Yeah. So you told your friend, did you just go home then and think, oh, I, I need to do something? Or did she help you with she, next? Um, stayed after me. So okay. um, I told her, I didn't think anything of it. I took my kids to like our local amusement park for the day. And I got a text from her while I was there. She's like, we need to talk tonight. And um, she had my husband and I over and I I knew that things were bad, but I still didn't really, Mm -hmm. I think I know, I think I knew, um, I think I knew they were bad. I just think I don't, I didn't want to recognize it. Yeah. Somewhere inside you, yeah, you knew, but there was some, this denial still that was kind of in your way. Yeah. Like my life, um, what my life looked like and what I was feeling didn't match. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to change what I felt inside to match what my life looked like, which was a family and 
functioning for the yeah. most part. Yeah. Um, and so that, that was very confusing for me. So it was a good thing that she followed up. That's a good friend. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. I'm really thankful that she was willing to open yeah. uh, the conversation. Um, for me, someone willing to talk about it, someone that was willing to um, go there was really welcoming to me. Yeah. I felt like, oh, this is someone that I can talk to. And this is someone that's willing to hold whatever I'm feeling. And so yeah. what are, what are some good things that a friend could do in the situation? What are some signs that they could look for? Um, my listeners probably are like to be helpers and they were like, oh, well, what would I do? Like, what should I do in this sort of situation? If I have a friend that may be in crisis. Right. So, um, that's a really, a really great question. I think if someone has a plan to harm themselves, I think that is an immediate red flag, some sort of emergency um, calling for help right away, mm -hmm. especially if they have um, kind of the means to complete that plan and have an idea of when um, they want to do that. I don't. Yeah, the more specific the plan is, the more the more like immediate crisis is happening. They've thought through this. They're 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 kind of on the next step. I don't feel like you can do the wrong thing when you're trying to lovingly help someone get help. Um, so we have crisis lines in our community. I think most people have those. Um, if they don't have a therapist, you can call into a therapist. They're hard to get into. You can utilize the emergency room. Some communities have um, crisis centers. Mm -hmm. um, and so as, if you do, if you end up in any of those places, if it's not the right level, I think that you, you'll get help. Yeah. You'll, someone will help you find the right level of care. Um, so the so, helpful friend doesn't have to be a therapist. They don't have to try to do therapy and figure out how to be a therapist for, for the person in, in trouble or in crisis, and it can but be they can reach out to somebody that can help figure out what needs to happen next. And that could be the crisis line or an emergency room, wherever you go, they will triage you most likely to figure out what you need. What's the most important thing to happen next for safety. Yeah, I think it can be really hard to be that friend who supports that person. Yeah, um, I usually tell people that they need their own support people if they're going to go, if they're going to walk with someone mm -hmm. uh, through this. And that person, I know I did this, that person uh, might get mad and frustrated. I did. I didn't want to believe it. I pushed any help away, um, but that, that's okay. And it will be worth it. They just might not be able to see it at the time. I am now very, very thankful for the help that I got in the moment. I was not, I think it's good to know that you don't have to know everything to be a helpful friend. If mm -hmm. you just say, like, I think you had said, like you could put your, put the, a crisis line in one of the contacts in your yes. phone. I have the um, yeah. So, I mean, that's just a real easy thing. And you can be like, oh yeah, I remember I put that in my phone. You can stay with the person until like the next plan is, is made with somebody that's really good in crisis situations. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't require skill. It just requires, I'm going to, I'll drive you to the place or I'll sit next to you while we make the phone call. Some people may already have a relationship with a counselor. And so you could sit with them while, while they call their counselor's emergency line yeah. and then they're there. If they have a relationship with the counselor and they realize it's an emergency, the counselor can then decide what the next best thing is. So you don't have to know all the things you don't have to have like a degree or anything like that. Yeah. Just holding space for that person and whatever, um, thoughts, feelings, experiences they're having, holding non-judgmental space, I think is one of the most helpful things you can do for someone. Yeah. Do so you finally move past the angry at your friend? And you found somebody that knew what you needed next. And so as you're working through different things, uh, what was that process like for you? Um, I went and did some intensive therapy uh, and good. I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about mental health in general. And one of the biggest things that I learned um, just being in the mental health community was that the people that were also utilizing these services were, were just like me and you, and they were nurses and teachers. Um, 
And I think I had a misconception in, in my head of who these people might be that I would be yeah. doing this with. And, um, they're just normal humans like, like us. So, yeah. What's well, interesting because you, somewhere in your brain, you were, you thought that this is normal. Everyone experiences this, mm-hmm. but while it is very common, it, it also me, it didn't mean that it wasn't something that needed to be addressed. So something that is relatively prevalent, um, different sorts of mental illness, mental health concerns, and can be something that needs to be addressed pretty quickly. And I don't think people talk about it. I don't think you like share about your group therapy or your intensive, whatever you might've done. Um, and that's kind of part of the stigma and the, and the shame that's around it. Um, but there are people utilizing this or these services and they are just like me. Yeah. My brother had dealt with different issues with, um, mental illness and depression. Uh, he passed away a couple months ago, um, from pancreatitis, but, um, through a lot of his health issues, he also dealt with a lot of depression and there were different times where he had different levels of care. Like you said, Sometimes he was hospitalized because he knew that he was a risk to himself and that there, there were other like step down things that he experienced where he would do a thing where it was like his job to go to therapy and he'd get dropped off at, um, the place that would do like group, group sessions. And then he stepped down to just meeting with his own counselor. Sometimes these things will happen at the same time. uh, or overlap a little bit. Like you may do group and individual stuff. Um, but the idea is that everybody has a different level of like, what is the immediate crisis right now? So, um, and and, responds to different interventions Yeah, Um, while they're trying to figure out what kind of medications might help at the same time. Sometimes you need more supervision when they're trying to figure out medication and it's not because you're a terrible person. That's completely, your brain is completely broken. It just means, Hey, we know that just like if somebody was dealing with cancer and this is like, they're having a relapse right. and you're trying to figure out the medicine, we would do the same thing. So, um, I think finding help and getting help is very hard. Yeah. Um, our, our system hasn't made it easy for people. Um, and so I think that's the hardest step. And I think the people that choose to, to do those things and recognize their need for those things are just so very brave. Yes. So brave to step into a system that, you know, might cause more trauma, be hard. You're, you might not get the right help right away, but you're still willing to get the help in whatever form it comes. Yeah. You know, you know, you need it. Yeah. If you're like, uh, some of us probably like me, when you go through something that is this transformational, it changes you. Uh, it changes what, how you see the world right. and yeah. how you want to make it better. And so tell me what that was like for you then as you are getting healthy and you're saying, what can I do now? What can I do with like, I've learned some things from this that I kind of want to help my community with some things that are missing. Tell me Um, about that. Yeah. I think once you dive into the, I just, I think in systems. Um, and once I dove in, I was like, oh my gosh, what's happening. This is so hard for me to navigate. And I have the resources and I have the education, mm-hmm. get myself help. And it was still incredibly overwhelming. So we had a family member who had just left treatment, um, for mental health and trauma, and she needed a place to live. And we felt like we had great support here. Um, my support during the whole thing was amazing. My friends were fabulous. They would bring me meals and sit with me and answer texts in the middle of the night. Um, I couldn't have asked for a better support system from my friends. Um, And so like, you you should come here. Um, We can support you for a few days. And I was able to find a place for her to live. Um, That was not in our home. And she came, we got like all the daily living things out of the way. She learned how to ride the bus. She found a therapist. Um, and a couple of days into this, we learned that the people she was going to stay with, it, it wasn't going to work. And that mm-hmm. was a really good choice for them, but it was a really hard choice for us. 
um, because she, she was living in a hundred percent trauma mode, no, no fault of her own. Um, but there were sleepless nights and emergency calls, a lot of unsafe behaviors, which is how mm -hmm. trauma shows up a lot of times. And so we were trying to navigate the system and we learned that we had to wait for her to go into crisis before, so she could prove the level of care that she needed. That's um, a really hard she, thing about mental health stuff. Oh, it's so hard. Before she could access services. So here we are, just two or three months where we were just trying to hang on, uh, keep her safe, keep us safe until she could prove that she needed the level of care that she needed. But I love that you were able to, you knew where to call, you knew what was needed because you'd walk through that. And you knew that you had, how important it was that somebody walked through that with you. So sparked a desire to make change yeah. for me. And I'm able to sit on different boards in our community uh, and different advisory councils for hospitals and children's mental health, different things that I want to see. I want to, I want to make change. I want this to be easier for somebody else to get help. Um, so I've been really lucky to be able to do those things. Yeah. So tell me about then what that meant going forward for you with your, your church community. This seems like the perfect place to teach people about what it's like to deal with mental health things and have some sort of support systems in place. Yeah. Um, I began to talk to people um, who I felt were safe about my experiences. Yeah. And I learned that there were a lot of people within my church community um, that struggled with the same things I did, struggled specifically with some of the really hard things. Um, a lot of people who had been pushed away at a really vulnerable or messy time uh, in their life. And I wanted to see the church do better. I wanted. Um, I thought, I thought we had the resources to, to do better, right? To like, do something. I was, so was like? I was passionate and maybe, um, a little fiery, <laughs> not anyone else to feel how I felt. Um, I was very, very close to losing my life to this. Mm -hmm. And if, if we can make a difference in one person, if we can talk about it, if we can break the stigma, uh, I was willing to to do that. I was willing mm. to talk about it. During a really hard season, uh, when we had our family member with us, one of my friends um, worked at the church, was our community group leader. And she came over to my house and said some really um, hard things. Mm. Uh, it felt very out of character for her. I was thrown off and it was really, it was really confusing. And, and, and it was hard to hear. Um, she told me that I was taking up too much space uh, in her head and that I thought my problems were huge, but to everyone else, they appeared um, tiny. Mm. And I thought I was too much. I believed I was too much after our conversation. And the previous summer when I struggled um, I was told a few times that people didn't know how bad things were. If I would have only been more open, um, talking about things. So I, I was open. Yeah. I was, I was talking about how hard things were. I was letting people into, um, gosh, just some of the things that were going on in our house. And I, um, felt like a burden. Yeah. And that's the last thing someone who has been open about their mental health wants to feel you've already like, feel like you're a burden. And now I felt like I was being told, um, that I, that I was a burden. She also told me that, um, numerous people in the church felt the same way that she felt, oh. but she wasn't willing to give me their names. And so I didn't know how many people felt this way. I didn't know who was safe. I didn't know who my community was. Um, we were constantly going into crisis in our home and I didn't, I didn't have anyone to call to help me watch my kids while we went off to the emergency room and sat there for a really long time. After our conversations, you know, we got together, we tried to reconcile a little bit. 
she did apologize. And I believe, I believe her. Um, it was a couple months later. And by that point, it had just become a much bigger, much bigger thing. A week after we had our conversation, a pastor at our church um, contacted my therapist without my knowledge. Um, mm, wow. I didn't have a previous relationship with this pastor. I knew we were on a, a first name basis and that's about it. Um, it felt like he was taking my safe place from me. He was trying to insert himself into uh, my safe place. Mm. I, I did wonder if like maybe the therapeutic relationship or the ethics that surround therapy maybe were, weren't understood. I also know that he didn't ask about me either. I was told later by my therapist that he spoke very highly of the friend that I had um, been working to reconcile with and he didn't ask any. He also told my therapist at the time that I wasn't to, to talk to my friend. Mm -hmm. um, they called it a communication break and um, I didn't really talk to anyone, anyone. I wanted to follow their rules. Um, and, and so I did. I mean, my heart just feels heavy processing that with you. Uh, feeling like this community that had been so supportive of you was suddenly taken from you. And even your safe counselor. Uh, like so many of these places that you had seen encouragement and support that were your lifelines, part of your whole lifeline system, were now cut off from you. Right. Um, I wasn't really like, I didn't know what, what I had done wrong. She had mentioned like what I felt like were a few annoyances um, of a, te a text I had sent her. Um, it was all between her and I. Mm -hmm. and, the friend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I know at a later meeting, I said, I felt like there was, you kept a record of wrongs and the, it was acknowledged, but it wasn't discussed any further. At a later meeting, um, the pastor had told my husband that uh, my friend had reported to him that I was saying things that would not be appropriate for new guests or attendees to hear. Um, and then he told my husband, he didn't have any information farther than that. Um, I still don't know. I still don't have any information farther than that. Um, but when you have a church that's built on numbers and the amount of people coming in the door is very, very important. Um, these, these things, these things happen when you're really focused on numbers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think we've seen this happen, like even with good intentions, you could make some bad decisions. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, while the church did a lot of great things for you, this one still was a bad, just and like, just what, bad what was I saying? Uh, I was talking about vulnerable people and I was yeah. I was saying that I think our church could do better. And yeah. I took ideas to our leadership a few times. Um, our church was a planting. Our church had created a church planting network mm -hmm. uh, a few years before this. And so we were planting all these, all these churches, sending teams out. Um, and I felt like if our home church wasn't doing a great job of caring for messy and vulnerable people, if people didn't feel like they could um, be open, I didn't know how our church plants were going to do that in their communities. Yeah. Um, and when I, when I spoke to other people within the church, I realized that I wasn't alone in feeling this way that we could, uh, we could do better. And so we had a lot of meetings with pastors and elders. Um, we tried really, really, really hard to stay. Mm -hmm. We did not want to leave our community. Uh, those were, those were our people. And I think they listened to us. There was one time where the pastor reported that he had timed how long I had spoke at an, oh, at an earlier meeting. And so we were given their time, but I don't feel like it was with a desire to understand or learn. About why, why would they time somebody? If I can think of no other reason except for that they had already decided 
that you they took up too much time and through. they were going to tell you how much time it took. And that's what they, that's what they did. Ooh, I don't like that. So my goal was to like, understand who my community was, was to put it all back together and, uh, to talk about the communication break. Like that was not healthy. Um, it didn't seem to model biblical restoration. Yeah. Um, and I was actually told at a meeting that it was successful because my friend felt better when I wasn't talking to her. Um, and I, I don't think they, I think they were trying to do the right thing and the right thing for them is through the lenses of, um, building a church and numbers. Um, it wasn't the right thing. It was really harmful for me, but at this point, did I, did I matter? Mm -hmm. Um, especially if I was seen as attacking or preventing the church from doing what they yeah, I would be second guessing everything I said and being really worried in every meeting. Like, did I talk too much? Did I say the wrong thing? Did I share too little or too much? It's just an impossible situation to be in. Am I going to be called more things? Am I, is, am I proving mm-hmm. to them that I'm too much? Yeah. Uh, even, even bringing up this consideration, I was nervous that here I am bringing up something that I think we should do better. Yeah. Yeah. And is this making me appear more divisive? Um, and it did, it did. Uh, I was labeled divisive for sure. Mm -hmm. And we had a relationship with a pastor, uh, in the church. And so we were speaking to him about our situation. And he was one of the first people to say, like, I'm really sorry uh, that this is happening. But the pastor, so the first pastor uh, is my boss, and I can't approach him. Um, Both of these pastors were considered elders. Uh, And so there you have like a business model where it's, it's all going to the top, it's a top down approach. Mm -hmm. And there isn't, there isn't accountability. There isn't accountability when the pastors are worried about the job structure. Yeah. Because speaking up for you, even if they agreed with you, might cost their job. And that was not a risk. That person thought that they should be making, apparently. That's really sad. Yeah. Yeah. So in the end, they didn't have any issues with anything that had happened. Um, And they didn't think they had done anything wrong. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So the friend who had approached me at the beginning was... Um, it was called righteous anger. Mm -hmm. And I was told of all these exemplary things that she had done when he was trying to explain to me that it was righteous anger. Um, But it also inferred that I was not exemplary. I'm not exemplary. I don't think anybody uh, is, but Mm -hmm. it was obvious to me that the ministry that we were doing in our home, loving someone who's really struggling wasn't it didn't matter it didn't matter if if this kind of thing is going to happen while we're doing this in our home um mental health ministry didn't matter and I, I realized this is why this is why people don't talk this is why people don't say what's really going on this is what they're afraid of the pastor had only heard about my life. I'd never really spoken to him. Uh, and, and my life looked like a mess, like an absolute mess. Um, and that's true. That's what it was. Um, but I can only assume that there was some decisions made in this process based on how, what, based on how he felt about the situation. I mean, based on his small picture of who you were, that's all he had to go off of. I've experienced things that I think some would label much harder than spiritual abuse, but I think that this experience has been the hardest to recover from um, of anything that I've experienced. Yeah, well, it mixes up your faith and your mental health crisis and the place where you feel the weakest. Right. It's like abuse tells you you're not worthy. Spiritual abuse says you're not worthy and God agrees. That's really hard to pick apart. Like 
the verses that were used. And so now God is actually supporting what their behavior is, but I don't, Mm -hmm. it doesn't look like Jesus. Um, so it, it's very hard to pull, uh, your faith and the actions of, of the people that are supposed to be professing this faith. It's hard to pull them apart. Yeah. I mean, what, did you even want to go to church after that? Well, we were leaving and the, one of the elders said, if you're not attending church on Sunday, Satan's winning. And that may, that was confusing. Uh, we wanted to attend church on Sunday, but we didn't feel safe. And now yeah, we're yeah. trying to find, we're starting to start over in the same community. Uh, our community is not super big. And so, no, we took a break. We took a break. Mm-hmm. Tell me about your experience with church right now. Um, did you go back to a church? Are you in one right now? I know it's a complicated landmine yeah. to navigate. Yeah, that's okay. Um, we stopped going to our church and probably took four to six months off. And then Easter was approaching 2019 Easter. And we were like, mm-hmm. oh no, we have to go to church for Easter. What are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> and so we showed up at a church in the community that we knew a few people at, and we had heard good things about, um, and they welcomed us. Mm. And one of the things that the pastor said the first day we were there, he said, if you, if this is not the right place for you, we want to help you find that place. Mm. And that was completely opposite from what we heard leaving our church. We didn't hear anything. And he opened up his time. He sat with us a few weeks later for, I don't know, two or three hours and listened to our story. He apologized from a spiritual leader standpoint, which was really Mm -hmm. powerful for us. He saw us, he heard us. Um, He made himself available to us. He acknowledged that coming back to a church could be hard and he wanted to have an open dialogue and communication for anything that might be confusing or triggering um, for us. And it was just a whole new feel for us. I didn't know what I didn't know Mm -hmm. until I entered a new faith space and it felt different and it sounded different. And that's where I learned like they were doing their elder nominations and they said, write a letter to, and they don't, they were doing their board of director nominations okay. and they said, write a letter about someone who has served and been a part of our church for, I don't know. They said three to five years, maybe go ahead and write a letter to us. And we want to hear about them where our former church, there weren't elder nominations. They were pulled from the middle. And then we, we, pre- we were presented names and said, do you agree? Mm-hmm. And we put our name on those ballots. And so if you didn't agree, there was no like anonymous voting. No, you had to put your name next to whether you disagreed. And so I was like, really, we we could do it this way. I've never heard of this way. Yeah. Um, And there were lots of moments like that when it's like this, this feel, and it was healing Mm -hmm. to replace some of those hard memories and negative memories with church and faith leaders with good ones. Yeah. Um, we can fight really hard to try to get over some of our experiences, but I found that if we are able to replace them, they don't trigger um, us up as much. Yeah. It's still hard for us to make it every Sunday. Yeah. Um, all of our, our whole family doesn't always want to join. Um, and I wouldn't say that we are not members. We don't really desire to become members, but at, mm-hmm. at this church, from what I can tell, that's not necessary. You yeah. just can jump in where you want to jump in. How are you approaching the church differently than you did previously? You know, you said one thing is you aren't a member and you're not planning on becoming a member right now. Um, mm-hmm. Was there anything else that sort of is different about your approach or how you hold this this whole thing. Um, we got involved when we wanted to and what we wanted to. Um, I feel like in v- evangelical circles, there was this big push to get plugged in. And sometimes I feel like it's 
getting plugged into this church and not plugged into Jesus. Mm. You get involved in what you like, and then you meet people that also like what you like. And it's just kind of this natural community that evolves from that. Yeah. They're not perfect. And they know that Mm -hmm. what I found is just very approachable. Um, We were looking for humility and accountability and leaders. Mm -hmm. Those were our two big things that we wanted to see at a new church. And that's what I feel like we found. I love that. Um, Maybe you're like me in that. I mean, I can relate to not being a member of a church and feeling welcomed, even Mm -hmm. though we're not members, but I also sort of feel reticent to promote any church, even the one I'm in. Like, I don't want to be like, Hey, everybody, this is the one. Yep. Does that make sense to you? Yep. And this, I think they'll say we're not the one. And just saying that I feel like is powerful. Um, We were part of a large church and we moved to a smaller church. And when we met with the pastor, we said, what are you going to do when you get big? How are you going to not run this like a business? Um, Because it's, it's, we, we figured it's just going to happen. And then we might experience some of the similar things we experienced at a larger church. Yeah. We value relationships and we value the natural building of our community. And I was like, Oh, like you don't have to push numbers. You can push. That's interesting. Allie, how long ago did you start your account, the Bruce Faith account on Instagram and tell me about that, what you decided to do and how that's worked for you? Um, I remember actually talking to you and feeling like I wanted to start something or talk about these things. Um, and I didn't know how to do it. And so I got a website, but I've never posted, I've never posted on it. Just one day I, um, was sitting across the table from a new friend and we were talking about a presentation we were doing together on mental health and substance abuse. And she had mentioned that had happened that was hard for her family. Um, And she mentioned the church that it happened in. I think that was the night that I created the Instagram account because I was, here's yet another person who had a poor experience and was no longer involved in a church of any Mm -hmm. kind. Um, And so that's, that's where it came from. I think the name just popped into my head. I have no idea where that came from. Um, And I just started writing about some of the things at this point, it had been three years when I started the account. So I just started writing about some of the things that I had learned and some of the things that um, I I fought really hard to gain an understanding of what had happened. And I wanted other people to have some of that information. Yeah. I see the results of that. I can see that you, I can tell by the things that you post that you have been reading and listening to the smart people in this area, the Diane Langberg and Wade Mullen and um, these people, these voices that we trust. And Mm -hmm. I love that you are like, Hey, I've learned some things and here are, here's, here's it in a easy to digest Instagram square. And sometimes you're hilariously funny with your reels. Thank you. Thank you. Or memes that you share. Um, sometimes it's a little tongue in cheek. Sometimes it's really serious mm-hmm. and it works really well. What is it about the Instagram like medium that you love? Um, it's, it's the only one I understood. Yes. <laughs> it was easy enough for me. I've used Instagram personally. Um, it's pretty much the only social media that I've ever used. I wanted to give people a place that they could land if they were confused. Um, Like here's a bunch of information. If you're confused, wondering, doubting, um, then take what you need and whatever hits you, hits you, right. It's there. It's there for you. Um, I love, I do like making reels. Sometimes you just have to laugh about your experiences and I can get sarcastic. So that's where those come from. Yeah. Um, It just, it was easy. Yeah. And I feel like when I talked to Lori Ann Thompson about how we need to be careful in this space to take care of ourselves and have really good boundaries and 
how easy it can be to suck, to be sucked dry. I see this as your like active defiance and creating something fun and useful that's life-giving for you. Does that sound right? Um, it ha- it has been good for me to write. I don't consider myself a writer, um, but it has been it has been helpful for me to write through some of these things. And you're a creator. <laughs> you're a creative. I can see that in like the Instagram is a visual medium. It's not so much, I mean, the words are important, but you have a way of putting the words and that visual thing together that grabs people's attention. And I think it's, I think it's fun. I think it is. You're saying that I would not consider myself. I didn't know how to use Canva. That's all I use. And, um, I don't pay money for anything. I use (laughs) Canva too. Yeah. I I do pay money. I don't like schedule things. I don't like, I think the beginning of the day is the right time or having things on certain yeah. days, I just post when I feel like I have something to say. Yeah. Um, and then I don't, I could go two or three weeks without really thinking that I don't, I don't really have anything to write about. So I'm just not, I'm not going to post. Yeah. No pressure. It's not like you're trying to make your living, support your family, right. make it into anything else. This that's like, I'm, keep the pressure off. Very blessed to have it be that way. Yeah. I love that. I really do. And I really like how you have specifically niched down where it isn't really, it's really about people that have been harmed or encouraging people that have been harmed. So it really doesn't matter what your theological background is, um, where you are in regard to whether you're still consider yourself a Christian or you don't consider yourself a Christian. If you're going to a church or you're not going to a church, um, those distractions aren't a part of it. It's just, I see you. I see you. And and here are some things to think about. That's exactly what I want it to be. When you experience um, hard things in the church, you are, you aren't seen Mm -hmm. and you carry, at least I did. I, I gathered all these beliefs about myself that weren't true, but it was what I was hearing and it was what I was feeling. Um, And so I want to be a useful space where people can go and say, okay, that's not true about me. Yeah. Um, and be helpful in helping people fight those, those lies. I'm still fighting those lies daily. Yeah. You're speaking to yourself, your former self, no. yourself in the trenches. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, dear younger Allie. I think I, I wrote something like that. I know you need to hear this. Yeah. Your and... church leaving self. Mm-hmm. You're going to be okay. And it's going to be hard. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of 